some people might trickle in uh, as we go, uh, but I'll introduce myself. My name is Anne Huang. I am the former senior intern at Career Development, uh, but I'm back here today to help with this event, and I'm really glad to be back. And today's uh, PLS is focused on environmental science. We have Dr. Inoma Omoraju with us today. Uh, before I get started, I'll go ahead and give everyone just a quick rundown of how the event typically goes. So we have until two o'clock, and we're going to start with the moderated Q&A session, and we'll leave some time at the end for any student questions. Uh, but since we're a very small group right now, uh, I... Aisha and Samiha, uh, forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, uh, but if you have any questions throughout the session, you can go ahead and just drop them in the chat box or raise your hand, and we can also answer them uh, as we go. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, to start with, Anoma, can you please introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of your career trajectory so far? Sure. Um, first thing I want to say is um, thank you, Anne, for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you today. I really appreciate it. It's, it's a real honor to just uh, to be able to tell people about some of the work that we, I've done throughout my career and at the health department. So um, myself, as everybody hopefully knows, I am Associate Director of Environmental Sciences at the New York City Public Health Laboratory. And I am an environmental microbiologist by training, which means I study microbes in the environment. And so that um, basic career choice has taken me to a lot of places around the world. And it's also resulted in me doing some really cool things throughout my career. So um, although I did my undergrad in upstate New York at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, I moved to Santa Cruz, California from New York to do my master's degree in marine sciences. And my thesis was on how microbial mats, which are these really cool microbial communities, converted nitrogen into a usable form. And then from there, I, I moved to Bremen, Germany, where I did my PhD in marine microbiology. And I, my thesis there was uh, on deep sea microbial communities that utilized um, the emissions from underwater volcanoes to support their lifestyles. And that was pretty cool work because it kind of worked that you need to use a submarine for. You can't just walk out and get the samples. You actually had to get a research vessel and a submarine to pick up the samples and bring them back up to the surface. And those depths were really, really, really deep. They're about two miles below the ocean surface. And so that was pretty cool. And, and after that, I moved to Manchester in the United Kingdom and I joined a European research network where I was a lead microbial biologist. And my, the work of that network focused on trying to understand the release and cycling of chemicals in drinking water aquifers. Um, and, and that was actually pretty cool because not only did I get to live in a few different places in Europe as a result of that work. Um, for instance, I lived in Manchester, I lived in Belgium, I lived in the Netherlands. I also had a lot of research work that took me throughout Europe. I had field sites in Greece, I had field sites in Romania and Hungary, and then even work in Switzerland and Italy. And, and I, I was in that position for about, I would say three years. And then I, I moved to Madrid, Spain, where I took up a position um, at the Center for Astrobiology. And so that work that we did there was really cool because um, the type of microbial communities that we we're working on were what are called extreme microbial communities. And we study those communities for two very good reasons. One, it helps us understand what are the boundaries of life. And it also helps us understand how life on other worlds may work because these very extreme communities, whether it's temperature or heat or minerals or so on and so forth, are very similar to some communities that we think exist in extra extraterrestrial worlds like Mars and, and so other places. And so I did that work for about two years. Um, and then I moved back to the States. Um, I, I then took up a position at the Department of Environmental Protection, where I oversaw the drinking water, um, drinking water microbiology section. Um, and that was the purpose of that work was just ensuring that the, the water that most New Yorkers are drinking or all New Yorkers are drinking meets the appropriate scientific and technical standards. And then from that position, I then moved to the Department of Health, where I am now, and I am uh, the Associate Director of Environmental Sciences there. And I oversee um, a section that you know um, does anything from uh, conduct testing to understand the sources of foodborne outbreaks, all the way to testing to understand what type of diseases circulate in tick and mosquito populations. 
That's really I'm amazing. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go, on, go on, go on, go on. No, I, um, yeah, I thought uh, if you were done, I was going to say it's really amazing how um, not only did you study environments, but you actually moved to so many yeah. different environments, able to experience and do research there firsthand. And, you know, it, uh, please continue uh, if you had anything more. But um, if you could also kind of like elaborate on what like a typical day for you looks like as the Associate Director of Environmental Sciences at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Sure. Um, so what does my typical day look like? So I guess I, I can start by just saying, you know, a little bit about what we do there. So like if you've ever gone to like a New York City beach, for instance, or if you've ever, you know, gone to a restaurant and gotten ill afterwards or like been bitten by a tick or mosquito, we're the folks that do testing to try and identify the source of that illness. What made you sick in the food that you ate? Um, we're the folks that conduct testing to ensure that the, the beaches that you swim in are safe for you to swim in. We also do testing to try and identify, you know, what, um, what pathogens are circulating in tick and mosquito populations. And we do all of that and, and so much more. And so what my day is, you know, kind of varies from day to day, but it's typically meeting with my colleagues and partners to ensure that those kind of programs are running correctly, um, that we are always meeting the best scientific and technical standards and that we're aware of, um, of new and emerging concerns and always taking appropriate steps to make sure where the city's adequately responsive to that. And so that's a lot of meetings, unfortunately, a lot of emails as well too, but um, at the end of the day, it's still very good work and something that um, I and my colleagues really enjoy. Yeah, it's definitely very important to the overall well-being of the city. And so we're so thankful that you and your colleagues are there to be able to find the different sources and, you know, making sure that things are safe and kind of uh, as a follow up to this question. And also that's uh, similar to the interest of what um, Aisha hopes to learn today. Can you tell us about some of like the functions and current developmental activities right now going on um, at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene? Sure. So um, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is a fairly large agency. We're about 6,000 persons. And the role of the agency in the city is to um, protect the health of New Yorkers. And so that's a very broad mandate. Um, that includes things like running a series of public health programs, like responding to the current in COVID-19 pandemic by providing testing services, vaccination services, um, guidance, doing research to try and understand how this pandemic is evolving and cases are being transmitted um, throughout the city. It includes things like trying to prevent the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, prevent the transmission of things like tuberculosis. Um, it includes things like um, investigating cases of foodborne illness, cases of waterborne illness, uh, and even you know conducting vector-borne and zoonotic disease surveillance. And so vector-borne diseases are typically diseases that are transmitted from arthropods like ticks and mosquitoes, so like Lyme disease for instance, if it's ticks or West Nile virus from mosquitoes, and zoonotic diseases or diseases are transferred from animals, so things like rabies. And so we do this and so much more, like even things like, you know, trying to tackle drug addiction is something that the health department works on. And so th that is just an incredibly broad mandate. And, and so within that organization, there are just a lot of different professionals that work there. Um, we have microbiologists like myself, we have engineers, we have chemists, we have epidemiologists, we have legal professionals, administrative professionals. And so, you know, regardless of what your expertise are, you could usually find a place within the health department in one of those areas. Um, but the area that I work in is within the laboratory. So we typically um, are looking for people with STEM backgrounds. So people that with microbiology, chemistry, um, even data science backgrounds, for instance. Yeah, and um, as part of that, you mentioned how because the agency is so large, there are many different projects, and especially with COVID nineteen, I'm sure you've had a lot of uh, of new projects come up. And kind of going on from that, has how has COVID nineteen affected your role specifically as an associate director of environmental sciences? And has your team or maybe any of your colleagues worked on any research projects relating to COVID? So if I so the first part, like I take the first part and then try to hopefully remember the second part. Um, COVID-19 has really had a very pervasive effect upon us here in, at the health department. Um, you know, and it's, it's in, in ways that are not always evident to people. Um, for instance, you know, we, you know, we, I work in a laboratory 
and that is a very that's a human run enterprise and we rely on a lot of you know communicate a lot of physical and contact and uh, meetings and things like that to get our work done and so when COVID-19 hit we had to change the way we interact with each other because we had to observe social distancing rules so people in the laboratory didn't get sick um, we also had to have more meetings and things like that and another issue too is that you know we could not shut down we had to keep going right so even way before the pandemic started, you know, we were preparing for the response for the pandemic because we would always prepare just in case things turn out, you know, to be the way they actually are right now. Um, so that meant a lot of folks are working, you know, six, seven days a week, working late nights and things like that, responding to the pandemic. And it made pretty much everyone an expert in COVID somewhat. So even myself, I'm an environmental microbiologist. And so I had to, um, learn to develop COVID-19 tests, I had to participate in COVID-19 research projects. My staff had to perform testing for COVID-19. And all of this, mind you, we still had to do while we were running our, 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 our surveillance program. So just because it's a pandemic doesn't mean we stop surveilling for tick and mosquito-borne diseases. You know, just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean we stop investigating cases of foodborne illness. And so that pandemic, not only has it changed the way we interact with each other, it's just put a lot of strain in terms of some of the programs you run, because those programs need to keep going. Yeah, it's um, it's I'm I can imagine how crazy it is that it became like an additional project uh, on top of what you already are working on, but um, it's really wonderful that, you know, the city has departments and teams like yours that are there to help us hopefully move through uh, this pandemic and kind of going off from this pandemic and how your team has had to take on, you know, additional roles. What is something that you wish more people knew about either public health or just the environmental science industry, or maybe something from, you know, what your projects on COVID have been that you think are important to be aware of? Okay, so I would say from what I wish people would um, take more from um, in regards to public health, like I wish people had more of an understanding of what public health is and the impact of it on in their lives. Because believe it or not, public health is something that sort of touches in every aspect of your life. Um, and I also wish that people would know that this is a career path that they can get involved in. Like it's a career path that can attract many different types of professionals. I gave you a list of the ones earlier that work in the health department, but, you know, and I'm sure I'm forgetting other ones. Um, and that we're, that this is a field that is always looking for people. It's a field that, you know, if you joined, you can serve not only your community, but you could also sh serve the nation because a lot of the work that we do, you know, is not only just for New York city, you know, for instance, when we investigate foodborne outbreaks, you know, that outbreak might lead us to, you know, a supplier in another state, you know, it might lead us to a supplier or a vendor in another country. And that, that, that necessitates us working with other states. It means that we have to work with places like the CDC or the FDA. Um, and so th those are sort of things that I, I hope that, you know, I wish that, you know, that from the pandemic that people have learned about public health. Yeah, I, you know, there are many takeaways and it's great to be able to have direct insight from somebody who's working directly on the other end of, you know, helping with COVID um, procedures and testing and things like that. And kind of along those lines, you know, what are some challenges or difficulties? You know, I know you mentioned having that additional workload, but are there just, was there ever a time in your career where you faced a significant challenge or setback and what did you learn from it and how did you overcome that? Yeah, so I, I would say, I, like many points in my life, in my career, I, I faced um, challenges and setbacks. But I, I think the biggest one, the one that sort of, um, I think carries the biggest imprint in me is when I moved back from Madrid, Spain, back to the United States. And so um, when I moved back, I, I didn't have a job. I, I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do. I know I needed to change, I wanted to change my career, but you know, I, I just wasn't sure how to do that. And, you know, like everyone else, I put in a lot of applications. Like I was applying to jobs almost every single day. Um, so I, in that time period, I probably put in like hundreds of applications. And, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, the world, the way the world works these days, you put in an application, you don't hear anything back. 
you know, and you're lucky if, you, if they send you something and tell you you're rejected. But I, I just wasn't even getting those. And I, I faced a lot of failure in that. And what I took from that was that one that, you know, you need to believe in yourself. Like I, I needed to know that I can change this situation, which I ultimately did. Um, but I also realized that, you know, you need to take the time to think about what you want to do and map a course, right? So, and that doesn't have to be something that's done in one day. You know, there's, there's no time limit, you know, to figure out what you wanted to do, what you want to do. And that, that's something that I, those are sort of the lessons that I drew from that period. Um, and, and those are things that I sort of take with me whenever I face any other setback. Like I always think to myself, like, this is something that I need to stop, um, take one or two steps back and think about how to actually um, persevere or how to actually beat what's going on. So, and I would say as a scientist, you know, I give an example of me moving from, you know, Madrid to, um, you know, back to the United States. But like a scientist, we just face a lot of, you're always going to have setbacks. Your experiments are just not going to work. Like even an experiment that should work. Believe me, I've had lots of experiments in my life where the instruction said it should work. Right? And it doesn't work. Like all I have to do is put batteries in something. And it doesn't work. So th those sort of things happen. Um, but you always have to just stop and take one or two steps back and think about why isn't this not working? And then from there, go forward. And usually when you do that, things turn out to be okay. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, I can definitely relate firsthand, you know, both as an undergrad who's moving into, uh, you know, graduating soon, but then, you know, with the pandemic going on, opportunities are kind of up in the air. And it is a very, it can be kind of discouraging at times, I think, but then being able to persevere even just within like a science experiment is so important. Um, and that kind of ties into a great question that we have in the chat. Uh, Aisha says, thank you so much for all the information uh, about your ongoing projects. And uh, the question that she has is, what advice do you have for recent grads who are looking for public health research jobs? What kind of skills or qualifications uh, do you look for? And uh, I know you mentioned in our previous conversations, there are some ongoing Going opportunities um, at the Department of Health. So uh, if maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. So I, I would say for the first part, like what sort of skills are, um, are useful in public health? Like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there's a whole, there's a really broad swath of skills that you know, are helpful in public health um, because public health uses different types of professionals, right? So we have you know, people that you know, have marketing backgrounds, people that have legal backgrounds, administrative backgrounds. But the sort of work that I do within the public health laboratory, it's typically more um, the sort of people that we that we look for, at least in my area, are folks with STEM backgrounds, people in science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics backgrounds. Um, because those are usually the type of people that um, you know, can understand the tests that we run. And you know, it's much easier for those individuals to also become subject matter experts as well. And so beyond that, the sort of the advice that I, I give recent graduates is if you're interested in public health, I, I would first of all, start looking at different organizations to join and become a member of. So a good one is the um, Association of Public Health Laboratories, APHL. They have a number of fellowship and internship programs that if you're a recent graduate that you can apply to. They also have a network of public health laboratories and their job postings are, are linked to that. If you're interested more in epidemiology, there's also the, the Council of State and Terrestrial Epidemiologists. And they, just like APHL, have internships and opportunities for recent graduates, as well as you know, um, people that are further along in their careers. Um, there's also the American Society for Microbiology. Um, and they also have a lot of opportunities as well too. And so those are just about three organizations I can think of off the top of my head. With regard to the health department, we have, you know, if, you, if you're a recent graduate, you're sort of outside of, of, of this, but it, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. We have a health internship training program. It's called HRTP. Um, and every year we, we, we take on a number of interns that work in various parts of the health department. And that one, I think the deadline is like the next two weeks or so. And so if someone's interested in that, they, they, can, um, they should apply. We also have a... All our jobs, all our postings are listed on the New York City jobs website. So if you're interested in a position in the laboratory, 
um, you can go to that website and, and type microbiologist or type chemistry or type public health and it'll come up with all the job listings. And usually from those listings, you should be able to figure out which are the positions that are more entry level to, to much more advanced. So, but regardless, you know, you always get to a point where you have an interview. And I think you, know, you should always use, you know, interviewers are trying to learn a lot about you, but you should always use, you know, the opportunity to learn a lot from the interviewers. So if you go for a position, regardless of whether you get it or not, you should take the time to understand as much as you can from that organization. And if you do get rejected, I always recommend, you know, following up and just talking to them about other opportunities that, you know, exist in that organization. I would also recommend, you know, even just talking to them about, you know, what are the things that you can do to make your candidacy for a position much stronger. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's applicable for almost every major. And so that's really helpful information for any recent grab, regardless of, you know, what industry they hope to enter. Uh, and kind of elaborating a bit more on this question, do you have any advice for current Macaulay students or students who may come from historically like underrepresented groups in the STEM industry who are interested in pursuing, you know, a career in public health or the environmental field? Sure. So I, the first thing I, I always try and remember, because I, I, I one of the things about my career is I've been just kind of all over the place in terms of you know where I've been physically and also professionally too, some would say, um, is that you're going to be often in situations where you know the people in the room or the people conducting activity don't look like you or don't have necessarily the same shared experience as you, right? And so what I always try and remember is that that I belong there and I've earned the right to be there. And so that's what the first thing I would say to anyone is that, you know, you've earned the right to be there and you should be there. And you should not feel that for whatever reason, just because you walk into a room and nobody, like I said, looks like you or has the same shared experience as you, that you don't belong there. The, the second thing I would do is I would say, I would take advantage of all the opportunities that come your way. I, I would. You know, this doesn't have to do with necessarily being from an underrepresented community or anything. I think this is just basic advice for anyone. You know, take the time to talk to your professors. Take the time to talk to your teaching assistants. Take the time to talk to people on LinkedIn and your colleagues. Why? Because a lot of, a lot of evolution of careers happens in those types of conversations. So for myself, you know, Part of the reason why I ended up going from Santa Cruz to Bremen, Germany was through a conversation, right? So I was interested in conducting a PhD. I was interested in continuing to work in microbiology. So I had a conversation with a professor who ended up being my, um, my PhD advisor in Bremen. Had I not had that conversation, I wouldn't be there. And I probably wouldn't be here today. So that's the second thing. I think the third thing that I, I would say is that you, you should, how should I say it? You should take the opportunities to do internships, right? And that is kind of tied to the second thing I said. You know, if there's a subject you're interested in, you know, talk to a professor and see whether, you know, they have an opportunity in the laboratory, whether it's for money, whether it's for care credit or whether it's for nothing. Why? Because those experiences help you understand and develop your sense of self It'll help you understand whether this particular avenue is something that you want to go down. It also provides experience because when you apply for positions after you graduate, you know, if you don't have, it's going to, you'll be much more competitive if you have a little bit of experience going into that position. And it also shows that employer that's looking at your resume that you have some drive and you have some initiative because it's most of the time it's not required for people to do internships. It's not required for people to work in laboratories. So I would say that it's those three things are the things that I would, I would recommend to people. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I, I think, you know, internships teach us so much more and the experiences we end up gaining afterwards are always shocking where you never think you're going to learn this or that. And then at the end, you walk away feeling so much more knowledgeable and you feel so much more confident too, which I know you mentioned is also a really important part. And I think that's important, especially for honor students, because sometimes we might have, you know, 
we doubt ourselves or imposter syndrome. And so that's really great. And uh, Samiha has a question. Uh, she's asking, um, if you don't mind sharing, uh, what are some of the influences that your work has had uh, on decisions relating to public health? Sure, so um, I, I give you a couple examples. Um, part of my work is in investigating the sources of Legionnaire's disease outbreaks, right? And so through our work, we're able to identify a source, like a particular cooling tower that has caused people in the neighborhood to, to come down with Legionnaire's disease. And so when we identify those sources, the city is able to go to those places and, and affect some sort of remediation strategy. We turn off the cooling tower, have folks clean it to end the source of that outbreak. Another good example is um, foodborne disease outbreaks. So when you, if you go to a restaurant and you become ill, you, you know, you, the next day you'll, you'll go to your doctor, your doctor will take a sample from you and then send that to the laboratory and test it. And from that test, you know, they'll identify that you have a particular infection. Let's say it's an E. coli infection. And so your doctor will give you antibiotics. And, and that's kind of where your story ends, but it's where our, our work begins. Um, we will talk to that hospital and get that sample. And then we will isolate E. coli from that sample. And then we typically, um, this is getting into pretty heavy science, but we'll, we will sequence the genome of that organism kind of what we do for SARS-CoV. And we will compare that sequence from that organism to um, the sequences of other isolates that have been recovered from people in an effort to understand whether the thing that made you sick is the same person, that, same thing that made somebody sick in New Jersey. And oftentimes we find those matches. And using that type of work, we're able to deduce or able to work out what the source of that infection was. Maybe it was romaine lettuce, for instance, from a producer somewhere in the United States. And, and both of you, this person in Jersey and yourself got sick from it. Um, but through that work and identifying that source as uh, romaine lettuce or, or something else, we're able then to go to that producer and, and tell them you know, that they need to stop, tell them that they need to change things, thus protecting um, the, uh, the public from, from further cases of illness. We've also, one of the things that um, I should say too, is that when we look at, when we work on things like mosquito surveillance, we try and understand where the hotspots for mosquito breeding are. And we try and understand, you know, also where the hotspots for mosquitoes that have things like West Nile virus are in the city. And when we identify those hotspots through our testing, what the city then does is then sprays those areas to kill the mosquitoes. And so that's just another way that you know, our work sort of is it enables public health decisions because without this work, we would not be in a place where we could um, spray for mosquitoes or actually do anything to, to ameliorate that situation. Yeah, it's so interesting how, yeah, and Samia says it's really cool um, and super important work. And I have the same thought where, you know, if you go to the doctors because you're sick, oftentimes you don't think that there are follow-up measures after that. It's just, oh, I take antibiotics and then I'm done. But there's actually a whole system in place to ensure that, you know, there isn't like an, a major or hopefully help to prevent major outbreaks of things like E. coli or, you know, something along those lines. And kind of, you know, on the topic of like public health, um, I'm curious as to how you got your start within the public environment slash health sector. And if you've ever considered, you know, working in a private sector, because I know a lot of your work and background is focused on, you know, city agencies and the overall public health of the city. Sure. So I, I would say I got my start in public health probably about uh, seven years ago um, when I moved from, from Spain. Um, and that was the time, as I mentioned before, I wasn't really 100% sure what I wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, I spent many months trying to, trying to understand, you know, what are the things that excite me and what I would like to you know, dedicate my life or some period of my life to doing. Um, the position that I found at DEP was the perfect fit for that moment in time because it was a position that allowed me to serve the public it was a position that allowed me to use my science and technology background to actually carry out 
you know, those endeavors, right? So it needed someone that was a microbiologist. I was a microbiologist. It needed someone that was experienced in water testing, and that was my background from that point as well too. So, um, what I would say, like you know, in reference to your question, I've ever considered working in the private sector. I have, but you know, what has kept me working in public health? At least for the last 70 years, is just that you know, knowing that the work that I do is contributing to protecting the health of the people within the community, at least the community that I live in, and community that surrounds, um, you know, where I work as well. Yeah, it's really wonderful, and I know both uh, DEP and you know DOH are major factors as to why the city is able to run at relatively function um, healthily and will allow city residents to be able to live healthy lives as much as possible, given our circumstances. And because you also did mention uh, that you worked at DEP prior to moving to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, what was that transition like for you going from DEP to the DOH? And how does your curtain role differ, you know, aside from the fact that you're not focused entirely on just the water uh, systems uh, compared to your current role now? Sure. So, um, I would say, you know, going from DEP to um, to the health department, I, I don't think there was that transition. I, there was nothing really necessarily shocking about that transition. I, I think that the biggest transition shock to me came from, you know, working from academia and then going to work in government. Um, you know, just even in terms of how government worked in, in the onboarding process. You know, it takes many months, you know, after you apply to, to get an interview and many months after you even get an offer to start. Um, so that, that was just such a shock to see because in academia things move very quickly most of the time. And then I, I would say differences in my role, I think both roles were very important and are very important, I should say. Um, both roles were very busy and a lot of hard work. It, you know, DP, they were working seven days of eight, actually seven days a week. Um, the health department is, is pretty similar as well too. Um, but the roles that I have, just the scope of the roles are, are different. So like in DP, like my role was mostly focused, focused mostly on, I should say, um, microbial testing of drinking water. Whereas in the Department of Health, my role um, is much more broad. So I not only work on drinking water, I, I work on recreational water testing. I work on foodborne and waterborne outbreaks, surveillance and response. I work on, you know, surveillance of vector-borne diseases, um, for instance, you know, West Nile virus is a good example, um, Lyme disease, um, Zika, so on and so forth. So it's just, I, I would say that the scope of the two jobs are, are, are very different from each other, but, but both are pretty important. I think um, I enjoyed my work at DEP and I, and, I, and I think it was very good experience for myself and I continue to enjoy the work here at the Department of Health. Yeah. And like you said, both equally very important roles. And, you know, you mentioned working seven days a week, which is, is a lot, um, I'm sure, you know, both at DP and now at the Department of Health. And I'm curious as to how you kind of, you know, especially with COVID going on, how are you able to kind of main, you know, maintain your like emotional and mental health while, you know, being responsible for the mental and overall health of so many residents of New York City, how is that like? And maybe, you know, some experience from yourself or your colleagues about how you kind of adjust to that and, you know, working almost basically the entire week. Yeah, it's tough. It's, it's not an easy thing. Um, I think part of what helps me and I think helps some of our colleagues is just having some patience with yourself and others. Um, because when folks you know, working a lot and very stressed, you, you need to develop a system that allows you to diffuse the situation. And so having patience and being able to take time for yourselves and allow others to have time are ways in which, you know, you can take a very stressful situation and make it much more manageable. Yeah, I, I think a lot of uh, healthcare workers now, you know, or even your frontline workers um, can relate to that. And so it's, we're very thankful, you know, for, workers like you who are at the forefront, you know, of this pandemic specifically. And along those lines, you know, what is like one skill or attribute or maybe strategy that has kind of helped you the most throughout your career, you know, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic? 
Uh, that's a good question. So um, I would say the skill that probably has helped me the most is just a, a basic ability to persevere. Um, because like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, as a scientist, you just have, you have a lot of setbacks, you have a lot of failures, right? And, you know, and this is not even just science, just life, that everybody's going to have setbacks, everybody's going to have uh, failures. But you have to develop a system or mechanism for being able to overcome that. And I think just, you know, in my own way, you know, developing mechanisms and strategies, whether it's, you know, taking a little bit of time to think things through, you know, stepping back from a situation and trying to look at it from another perspective, you know, all those mechanisms have given me that basic ability to persevere and that, and just being able to persevere and get through those difficult times, I think it has sort of enabled me to be where I am right now. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. I think perseverance, it's, it's often easier said than done, but I think having the ability to push through and training yourself to be able to do that is something that can be very beneficial throughout your entire lifetime in, you know, your career, your personal life and things like that. And, you know, I'm sure perseverance, like you said, you know, after coming back uh, from Spain, that's, you push through a lot in order to finally get a job uh, within like DEP. So can you talk about an achievement that you feel the most proud of so far in your work, or maybe just an ongoing project uh, because of its importance right now, especially during COVID? Sure. So I, um, I'll give you two. So like I, I um, the first one is, you know, something that I, one of the achievements that I'm most proud of, I, I think is during my first postdoctoral fellowship, I, I essentially tricked a, a bunch of microbes to, um, I essentially tricked them to, to actually make minerals that um, can help clean up contaminated aquifers. And so I'll give you a little bit of the backstory behind that. So um, many places in the world, um, you have what's called microbial dissolution of arsenic bearing minerals. Okay, that sounds like a lot. So what that means is that you have microbes that are dissolving rocks that contain arsenic. And these rocks are in drinking water aquifers. And so when these microbes dissolve these rocks, you release arsenic into the drinking water. And so people drink that water and then what they end up getting, you know, cancers and all sorts of debilitating diseases based on drinking that water. And it's a serious problem throughout the world, like the places in South America and Europe, and especially Southeast Asia, where, where this it affects hundreds of millions of people. And what we did is we said, okay, we know microbes can dissolve these rocks. So is there a way we can get microbes to rebuild these rocks and, and take up that arsenic? And so, I, I worked on a study with colleagues from around Europe where we figured out a way um, to, to stimulate microbes to actually make um, arsenic containing minerals or minerals that store the arsenic. And so that's something I was proud of because I, I think that's something that not only um, allowed me to use my skills and my background, but it's something that I think can help the lives of millions of people around the world. So, in terms of things that I'm most proud of, I think that's one of the most proud um, achievements that I have. Then in, in terms of things that I'm working on now that you know, I think are important, um, in just in, if I stick to research, um, I would say is I'm working with a few researchers actually at Queens College that are trying to understand how wastewater surveillance can be used to help inform our COVID-19 pandemic response. And so I, I can maybe back, do one or two back steps in that and sort of tell you what that means. So um, SARS-CoV-2, SARS the virus that causes COVID-19 is excreted, can be excreted in your waste, right? And so if you can collect someone's waste, you can try and, and it can be excreted and it can be detected. Um, and so if you can collect waste from millions of people, you can get an idea of how many people in a community are infected. And you can get an idea of how you know, what variants they're infected with. And so for the last year and a half, I've been working with researchers, as I mentioned in Queens College, um, Professor John Dennehy and Professor Monica Torrio in trying to understand how that sort of information from wastewater can help inform our work and our, our current COVID-19 response. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is so interesting because to me, the first thing I think of is sometimes individuals may be asymptomatic. So they might go through 
an entire time period where they were positive or had COVID, but never knew because they just never had any symptoms and never had any reason to get tested. And having that kind of research information, I'm sure is pertinent to the overall data and the collection of, you know, the city's well-being and kind of things along that line. And so that that's just very interesting to me. Um, but you brought up how, you know, like you worked on the microbes. And I'm curious, you know, based on your current role now, uh, because some of these projects seem like they require a lot of time within the lab. So are do you still currently spend a lot of time like doing hands-on, you know, research within the lab? Or are you more so of just behind the scenes more like what's that balance like for you now? Uh, in your role as a director? I, I would say I'm much more behind the scenes. I, I'm not in the lab anymore, unfortunately, or some people say fortunately, because my head sometimes we're not very good in the lab. But um, I, I think, you know, as your career evolves, you know, you transition from various places. Like I, I spend a lot of time in the lab as an undergrad, as a master's student, as a um, you know, as a PhD student, as a postdoctoral fellow, and even when I first started in DEP and Department of Health, like I, some of these, these roles were new to me. And so I, I didn't want to be someone that, you know, didn't have any firsthand experience. So I got qualified in testing. So like the first two years I was in the Department of Health and then I was qualified in testing um, drinking water samples. I was qualified in testing, um, uh, microbial isolates to determine, you know, the relationship with each other. Um, and I think that really helped me develop a better understanding for, um, for the work that I now currently supervise. Yeah, that's amazing that, you know, you were able to get that firsthand experience and that you wanted to. And that kind of leads into the next question, which is, you know, are there any like civil service tests or certifications that you'd recommend if anybody is, you know, specifically interested in going into like environmental science or public health that you think would be very beneficial? So civil service tests, it, it, that, that's, it depends. That's a little tricky. So like um, there are many jurisdictions, New York is one of them, that sometimes um, in order for you to, um, to take up a certain position, you have to be on, you have to pass a civil service exam. And not all the positions that we have here in the laboratory work that way. In fact, I think most probably don't. Um, the positions that I occupy don't require a civil service act, um, exam, but the position that a lot of my colleagues occupy do require civil service exams. Um, and so there, there are civil service exams for like, you know, an associate laboratory microbiologist, an associate chemist, for instance, um, a laboratory microbiologist, and those are New York City civil service exams. But I, I wouldn't, the way I would go about things, I, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, just run out there and go take an exam. If one comes up, if you, you can go like New York State, New York City fortunately lists all the civil service exams that are, um, that are coming, that are going to be held for a given year. And so, you know, you can go on that, on that, on that website and check to see what the exams are. And, you know, whether any of those exams would, you know, would be relative, would be relative, relative um, relevant for a career in, in, um, in the public health lab or another segment of the Department of Health or in another city agency. So that, that's one way of doing it, or you can apply. Um, and then, you know, what can also happen is, you know, if you were to get the job or, you know, even before you get the job, you know, they could, people that you're interviewing you can recommend that you that you take a particular civil service exam. Um, in terms of other types of credentials, um, you can become what's called um, a licensed technologist or a medical, uh, medically, I can never say it properly, but um, for clinical testing <laughs> in New York and quite a few other places, you have to become a licensed technologist. And that usually requires that you go to a specialized school in medical technology. So Hunter College, for instance, is a good example of that. Um, and you'd go there and you graduate with a degree in medical technology and you take a licensing exam. And that would allow you to work in clinical labs throughout New York State and also throughout the country. Um, for us, our public health laboratory, that was something that we used to um, require something that we still very much appreciate in people that apply, but it's not required any longer. Having a background 
and some experience in, in, in testing, especially clinical testing, environmental testing is what we really need. Yeah, that's really insightful to, you know, the students who may be interested in applying for some of these public uh, health sector positions and how they can go about, you know, navigating these certifications and tests. And uh, we have a question uh, in the chat. It says, out of curiosity, uh, is data analysis a large part of the work done at either DP or DOH? Yes, I, I would say both um, really do a lot of data analysis. Um, I, I would say even just to give you an example here, um, we, you know, all the, when we sequence the genome from people, when we sequence the genome of isolates that recover from all over the city, you know, that, that generates a huge amount of data. And then we're constantly looking at that data to try and understand, you know, what are the patterns of foodborne illness in the city, you know, and where have these people gotten ill. Um, we do that even for, you know, waterborne diseases as well, too. Um, we do that for um, vector-borne disease surveillance, for instance. I remember I mentioned earlier that you know we, we test um, mosquitoes throughout this all over the city for anywhere from July all the way to October, and we test probably you know hundreds of you know mosquitoes a day, and so you could just imagine all those test results you know probably tens of thousands of lines of data that are available. Um, the city is looking at that information, trying to understand, you know, what it means and where they need to be responsive. So I, I would say for, you know, pretty much any city agency, there's just a lot of data that's being produced and there's a lot of data analysis that's done in order for them to understand what they need to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're, you know, especially given how large New York City is and working with the state, I'm sure there's always a lot of data uh, being collected and analyzed. And so that's, that's really awesome. Um, so we, Oh, it's exactly 1.50 now, uh, but I was going to say uh, we're nearing towards the end, so I wanted to open up to any of our attendees if you had any more questions. Um, if you want to go ahead and unmute because we're a very small group right now, uh, or if you you know want to continue putting questions in the chat, you can do that. Uh, if not, I can continue asking questions. We can keep going. Um, so I'll just give it a second in case uh, Samiha or Aisha wants to you know unmute or type another question. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, well, I'll ask another question so we can keep going. And then if you guys have any questions, you know, continue to put them into the chat. Um, but Enoma, uh, kind of going on to the research aspect a little bit. Uh, so you have over. Oh, Anne, I'm so yes. sorry. Um, it looks like Aisha had her hand raised. Oh, sorry. I missed that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I just had um, kind of another question about um, like job opportunities and kind of how to stand out as an applicant. So I know um, you said that um, having internship experience or, you know, kind of in the field experience is very helpful. Um, I in specifically don't really have like internship experience, but um, I have a lot of like project experience through um, the classes that I've done and like the professors that I've worked with. And I was wondering if like that kind of experience is also helpful or if I should kind of also be seeking out those, you know, internships with outside organizations um, and things like that. Sure. Um, could you define the projects? You know, what you mean by projects with professors? Um, yeah. So like the projects that I've been doing are using publicly available data, like NHANES data, um, and then like free software like R, and then, um, you know, like creating a hypothesis about an outcome I might be interested in and like an exposure I might be interested in. Um, but so it's kind of like research projects, but with publicly available data and um, publicly available um, data analysis tools. So I, I have a little bit of experience working with public health data, but it's not with like a formal organization. It's with um, professors for school projects or things like that. Um, so I was wondering if that, that kind of experience is also translatable to you know, applying for positions in the field or not. Of course, definitely. That, that to me, that sounds like an internship. It's not necessarily an internship with like a, I mean, it's an internship at, I, I'm not sure what college you're from, but it, you know, for instance, it could be an internship at Hunter College or Macaulay College or something like that, depending on where you are. So I, I think that that type of experience, especially, you know, the work that you're doing sounds like data analytical work. And, and I think that that is a field that is very much in demand. So I, I, I would say that, you know, 
what you're doing is directly applicable to our work. Um, and I am sure that there would be folks that would be interested in your background here at the health department and other places as well too. And I, I would, you know, just in general too, I, I would always, you know, I would always list experiences, even if you think they're, they're not necessarily relevant. Or you, like I would never, I, I don't think you should ever sell yourself short in terms of talking about what you've done. Um, you know, like from what you described to me, I, I find, I, I think that's amazing actually. It, it probably outstrips anything that I did when I was an undergrad, and probably comparable to what I did when I was a master's degree student. So um, I, I think, again, like that, that's definitely something that, that I think is, that works for, for our field. So then they, they might be sometimes, and I, I also need to qualify that. So sometimes they might be, um, where you can run into issues is, you know, some places might require um, that you have a certain number of work hours per week. So if that's a position that's like 20 work hours, that might not necessarily work. Um, or if it's like, you know, 25, it might not work. Um, or they might say specifically internships don't count. But I think, you know, those types of places are few and far between. Um, and I think, you know, listing that and, and applying, I, I think will, will, never, will never hurt you. So, um, and I think you can only gain from that because, you know, when you do go to those interviews, you know, and you can talk to folks and see what they, what they really require in these types of positions. But I, I think just based on what you said to me is like, you're graduating with, um, with some solid data analytical experience. Um, and I think that's probably a leg up for a number of undergrads, you know, that are reapplying to entry level positions. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I don't see any hands up, but um, if there are, please just let me know. My screen is a little bit smaller, uh, but I'll go ahead and ask another question. Um, but Samiha, if you have a question, you know, feel free to unmute. Um, but kind of going into research a little bit. Uh, so, you know, my, I was trying to say uh, you have like over 17 publications pertaining to you know, different environmental health topics, like you mentioned, microbial and mineral evolution. So I was wondering if you can give a little bit of information about like the process of conducting scientific research and also just becoming like a published author? Sure, so um, I, I would say, um, for start off by saying that, you know, publishing papers and especially research papers are probably simultaneously the most rewarding thing you can be doing as a scientist and probably one of the more frustrating things you can be doing as a scientist. And I say that because, you know, one, you know, publishing a paper you know, allows you to, you know, put your work out there for others to build upon, because that's the way the fields move. Everybody builds on everybody else's work. And so it's always very satisfying to be able to put out a piece of work and allow others to, to use it to forward a particular field. But those are very frustrating sometimes because um, it can be a long and difficult process. But regardless of how, um, you know, regardless of how that feeling ultimately turns out, um, most research studies are basically fall into, I would say, two different categories. You, know, you have applied research and you have basic research. So applied research is, are, is research that's usually conducted to answer a specific question. So like an example would be research that's done to identify um, the best spot for a vaccine to target on SARS-CoV-2. And basic research is usually research that you know, is done in order to I don't, I don't know, expand knowledge. And so example of that would be maybe trying to determine what, you know, the different amino acids or the different parts of the SARS-CoV virus do. And, you know, when I say basic and applied research, you know, those two areas of research are always kind of blurred together. Sometimes that things fall into one, sometimes things fall into both. And it, it but either, either way, regardless of, you know, where, you know, the research that one is thinking of doing falls into, you always need to start off trying to understand what it is you want to do, what questions you want to answer. So I gave those other examples, I gave those two examples, for instance, like, well, do I want to identify what the best um, site for a vaccine target would be on SARS-CoV-2, right? That's your research question, or it could be something else. Um, once you got that basic idea of what you want to do, what you want to study, um, unfortunately, you need to ask for money. Um, that's usually done by um, requesting funding from, you know, 
an organization like the National Science Foundation or any number of other organizations that fund research in the United States. So once you have once you have the money, what you then can do is start to you know accumulate and buy resources to carry out your experiments. And so you you do your experiments. Um, presumably your experiments go well, and so that can take anywhere from a few months to a few years. Um, and once you've got everything together, you've you've figured out all how to, to make all your experiments work, or you've canvassed enough people and gotten enough information, you can then proceed to write up that research study. Um, and you write it up, and then you'll submit it to um, a journal. And there are many journals out there. There's like Nature's, Nature Journal, there's the Journal of Science, um, there's Applied Environmental Microbiology, which is a journal that I've sent many articles to. There's pretty much a journal. There's a journal for every, pretty much every area. Um, and some, and they all rank in, you know, in order of prestigious to less prestigious. And some you have to pay if you submit a journal, if you submit an article, some you don't. But either way, when you send you know, that manuscript, that, that journal and ask them to publish it, what they do is they then send it out to your peers in a process called peer review. And so what peer review is, is that it, it gives the scientific community an opportunity to critique your work and make sure that your work is at the appropriate standard before it's published. And so that sometimes can be a very difficult um, endeavor or part of the process because you usually have to end up um, responding to the reviewers' comments and then the journal and a lot, sometimes a lot of back and forth. But what usually ends up happening is the quality of the work that you submitted to that journal usually gets improved because a bunch of people have looked at it that are not your friends, essentially. You know, their vested interest is not to make you feel better, but their vested interest in making sure that the, the body of work that's out there in the scientific community, community is the appropriate, it's at the appropriate level. And so once the journal, all that, oh, I'm running out of time, but I'll be really quick. Once the journal and all that has agreed um, that this should be published, um, you know, you then, uh, it then gets released by that journal. Um, and oftentimes that's done online. And so that whole process from, you know, submission to publication for a journal article, you know, could take a, usually takes a couple of months, I would say at least three months, sometimes it takes six months or longer, I've even had a whole year sometimes. And then that whole process from idea all the way to publication, that's usually something that takes a couple of years. Yeah, that, I mean, it's amazing, the entire publication process and just the research process. And I'm sure that makes it all the more fulfilling when you do get published um, as an author, which is great. And so we are at two o'clock now. So we're at the end um, of our time. But I want to say thank you so much, Anoma, for joining us today and for sharing so much of your experiences and insight uh, with us. Uh, for our attendees, we ask if you can please fill out the evaluation survey uh, just before you leave uh, the Zoom call. Um, but thank you so much once again, Anoma. And we hope for all of our attendees that um, you've learned a lot from this event. And uh, for all of the other students who weren't able to make it, um, we'll be able to share this with them. So thank you so much, Anoma, and thank you to our attendees. Great, thank you. I, I again, just wanted to say it's a real honor to, to speak to you guys today. And um, I, I'll leave my contact information with you, Anne or, or Emily, and so people can feel free to contact me and I will do the best I can to sort of direct their questions. Yes, and then we also, will share that. I think I owe you guys a bunch of links and, and, and <laughs> Uh, some recommendations and things like that. And so please do not let me forget about that um, and make sure that I, I, do, I do provide you guys what you need. So um, and that's it. And once again, thank you again. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Everyone.